Welcome back to the next edition of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm Jacqueline Cox, and today we are in Indianapolis, Indiana, at the Indianapolis Firefighters Museum with Howard Stahl. Welcome, Howard, to the show. Well, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you here today. Well, thank you for having us. You gave us such a great tour today of the Indianapolis Firefighters Museum. Can you tell us a little bit more about Firehouse Engine Number no. 2? Yeah, it uh, was one of four originally built in 1871 into 1872. It actually went into service in January of 1872. There was one central station downtown, too. Uh, the Indianapolis Fire Department started in 1826 wow. with a company called the Marions, which had a small firehouse over by Monument Circle. They just had a hand-drawn pumper in there and they had a, a hose reel in there. And as the city began to grow, more and more volunteer companies began to sprout up around them. So we had eight or nine different volunteer companies. Uh, traditions within the fire department were kind of funny at the time. Uh, it became a huge social focal point to be a member of sort of high society status. You had to be a member of the fire department. Oh. Uh, a lot of political decisions made in and out of the firehouses, which didn't go over too well with city leaders. And then as the insurance companies started to fund the fire brigades, uh, they started having things called fire marks that were on buildings. Okay. You would respond to the fire. If you were first due, if you had first water and you recovered the fire mark, you got paid for putting out the fire. The other companies didn't. So rivalries began to grow oh. between the different companies. They would sabotage one another's equipments. There would be fist fights at scenes, allegedly. I mean, allegedly. That, you know, legend allegedly. says anyway. Right. Uh, these things went on. And there were several large fires that happened at the time. The city began to really grow and prosper. Uh, they realized in 1859 that we needed a full-time municipal paid fire department. So they switched to that at the time. They brought in an outside man named Faudre okay. to try to get the department together to find the volunteer fire companies in moderate success, but around eight, late 1860s, 1869, they brought in a gentleman by the name of Daniel Glazier. Okay. Daniel Glazier was a true fire engineer, and he laid out what city fire protection should be. Built these four stations, one on each corner of Monument Circle and the central station downtown. He also put in miles of water cisterns underneath where you could go and, and drill down into and then pump water out of. So he modernized the fire service in Indiana, in Indianapolis. Unfortunately, Daniel Glazier was killed in the line of duty oh, on March tragic. 11th of 1873. He also taught the aggressive interior attack, which we still use today. It was the best way to fight a fire, was to get in, get underneath the fire, get to the seat of the fire, and get it knocked down. Extremely dangerous, as he also proved himself. Right. The Woodburn Sarban Wheel Works in 1873 uh, on South Illinois Street had a collapse. He was in with his men when the wall collapsed on top of him. So he was also the first firefighter killed in the line of duty. Oh. Uh, but he left in his legacy these four stations. As time went on, the city continued to grow. Uh, this station was originally Station 2. It became Station 8 for a short time. It was in service until 1933. Um, then it became several different things. There was a personal residence here, a tow truck service ran out of here, an auto mechanic ran out of here, and then it lay dormant and abandoned for probably two or three decades. Uh, they'd built a new addition off of the front of it, boarded up one side of it, they'd taken the bell tower down so it was unrecognizable as a fire station. We had a fire in the building next door. They forced entry into here to see if there'd been any extension to here. And as they were walking around, they said, this looks like a fire station. This was about 1983. So just by happenstance, the discovery of Firehouse 2. Found the only one of Daniel Glazier's firehouses still standing. Wow. So the local union, Local 416, the, the leadership at the time said, we have got to secure that and buy that, and we will move that, make that our new union headquarters. So they did about 1984, also bought the livery stable next door, connected the two buildings with a breezeway, and tore down the old front section of it, put new windows and doors in, rebuilt the bell tower, and it sat that way for a couple of years because we were out of money, essentially. Right. Uh, plenty, of, plenty of sweat equity into this building. Most of the right. work that you see here was done by firefighters, firefighters' families, or the friends of firefighters. And we've got it restored to where it is now. Uh, it, uh, our motto is preserving the past and protecting the future. So we have grown. We owe everything from the alley all the way to the point on Massachusetts Avenue, uh, St. Clair Street, everything behind it. All that is owned by Firefighters Local 416. Our credit union is here. The state union headquarters are here. Our union headquarters are here. We have the Firefighters uh, uh, Survive Alive uh, for children. Um, we also have meeting halls and things downstairs, and we've completely restored this into a, a 
fabulous museum. So this museum is literally a labor of love of the Indianapolis Fire Department. It is. From day one, uh, I joke and say these two buildings were never connected uh, in between the breezeway, which we now have, where there's a hallway. It was a, uh, it was a home for pigeons. So you can imagine when we went to put the roof on it and, and to put the skylight on it, uh, what we had to clean up all between the two buildings. And from there on, I mean, everything was just, uh, it had to be completely stripped down to the foundation and rebuilt up, and we've done all of that. So all in all, how long would you say the restoration took? We got the building in 1984, and we opened the museum and dedicated the Fallen Firefighters Memorial out front in 1996. So it took about 12 years to get it to where it was functional. Yeah. And to get it to where you see it today, we're still working on it. Right. Uh, it's for the most part done. We have the new addition off the side that was built about five years ago that has uh, the firefighters as a meeting hall, the uh, headquarters for Local 416, and then the top floor has a um, uh, area that we can go to for uh, uh, protein tactical is up there. We run it to them and, they, and we have a lot of orthopedic injuries and things in the fire service. So police officers and firefighters can go up there and get rehab by athletic trainers and physical therapists. And from what also what I understand, this is an, an event center. As it, well. is. it is. It uh, is. We're, we're part of the neighborhood. You know, right. the focal point of any city in a neighborhood is the fire station. Correct. It always is and always has been. I mean, from the time you're a little kid, just to wave at them as you drive by, you need air in your tire, you've got something wrong with you. Any, anything, everybody knows to go to the firehouse and, and they're gonna take good care of you there. So we're good neighbors. So we also have a huge event center that we have here. We have something going on today. As a matter of fact, we have some nurses that are in town that are having a conference. Uh, it can be anything that you want, weddings, receptions, uh, lots of different things, or a huge St. Patrick's Day party that we have here and other things that go on. Uh, and we're open to the neighborhood for stuff. So we own everything to the point. There was a large grassy knoll out here, which really serves more of a, a pet relief center station for a downtown <laughs> areas. Not a lot of grass in the downtown. And right. we have a huge parking lot across the way here. So it's plenty of room for everybody. It is indeed. Like. It is indeed. So I, I hear that you're saying the fire station is a big part of the neighborhood. Can you tell us a little bit about the neighborhood of uh, Jacob Petty and how he was part of the neighborhood? Jacob Petty served here. He came on the fire department in 1879. So he worked in these stations. He was at station one, which was the Northwest station at the time, made lieutenant and came to station two. He said the rest of his career here, he made lieutenant, captain, and then assistant chief from here. Legendary firefighter. To see him today, he, he'd walk into a fire station today and fit right in. Big strapping guy, sinewy, right. had a huge bushy firefighter mustache and all. If you see any of the pictures around back that are where the chief's buggy is out back, he's sitting up very prim and very proper in it. Right I mean, you could tell go. he was a proud right. man, but he was also a legendary firefighter. Uh, he had many rescues to his uh, credit. Uh, and even in a bow and marrow fire on uh, uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, 1890, we were fighting a fire uh, first block of West Washington Street in the bow and marrow um, warehouse it was a uh, uh, there was a dry goods store on one side and they were a publishing company so a lot of paper and things that were in there uh, and it had burnt from the basement all the way up to the top floor he was on the roof of the building when the building let loose and all floors pancaked down and took 30 or so firefighters with him we lost 12 firefighters that day killed in the line of duty a 13th died a couple of days later and we found three more so we have 16 total it was the darkest day in the in the history of the indianapolis fire that. department but jacob petty was working on the roof when he said he heard the snap and felt it move, and he was fortunately enough to be next to the parapet wall, and he leaped over the parapet wall and landed a story below, right in the midst of Engine Company 16's crew that was working at the time. Much to their surprise, mm -hmm. Jacob the Petty lands comes. in the middle of them, and then he looked through the window and could see the bodies of the injured firefighter oh. that lay in there, so then they were in a rescue mode after that. He retired in 1922, and uh, the old firehouse just wasn't the same without Jacob Petty around. So from, from what his legend has, he was a big part of the neighborhood and that he helped uh, start community programs and just took absolutely. care of, took care of every child and every family in the Abs neighborhood. Absolutely. Everybody knew at that time the captain at the fire station and everybody knew Jacob Petty. So, so we would say then then the Bone Merrill fire was one of the most deadliest fires in the Indianapolis Oh, history. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have talked about a, a few tragedy f and tragic fires here that's happened in Indianapolis. Can you tell us about another tragic incident that happened here with firehouse number two? Yeah, in 1897, like I said, it's a focal point of the neighborhood. So anybody needs anything, they come to the fire station. Somebody had come across the street from one of the stores and screamed there's a robbery underway. And one, several of the firefighters that were here, one being uh, 
pipeman, Frank Redman, uh, went over to see what was going on, and I think they called them highwaymen at the time, they were burglars or whatever. Uh, he uh, made his way out of the store, and they said, that's him, and they chased him down the alley and over this alley here, and right as he was about ready to grab him, he turned around and he, and he shot him and dropped him in the alley. They carried him over here, and he laid right here in the bay where we are until he passed away. It's one of the first tragedies here, number two. Yeah. So as I look through the museum and see all the pictures of everyone that has served in the Annapolis Fire Department and Station Number 2, I saw you had a wonderful memorial out there. Can you tell us about the memorial? Yeah, that kind of came uh, as a later addition as we had built this and it started to open it up and we had the vision of the museum and all. We had a fire in 1992 at the Annapolis Athletic Club where we lost two firefighters, Woody Galenius and Johnny Lorenzano. And after that, we realized we never really did anything for the fallen firefighters. So one of our members said, you know, we need to do a reading of the names and some sort of a march to remember everybody that had been killed in the line of duty. So we marched from headquarters over to the World War Memorial and we did a thing there. We invited all the families that we could possibly get a hold of, of the fallen firefighters. All of our people were invited and we did just a simple reading of the names. We'd put a carnation in, in a bucket and we'd toll the bell and, and remember the firefighters that had been lost. Right. After that was over with, one of the ladies, uh, survivors had come up and said, no one has done anything like that since my father was killed. Oh. And so much she really appreciated right. it. So that started the idea behind a fallen firefighter's memorial. Okay. And we had several different ideas. We looked at different things. We knew we wanted to put it right out in front of the museum to be the focal point of the museum. Uh, we got a uh, artist from uh, Brown County named Dale Enox, a uh, wonderful human being came up uh, not related to the fire service at all. So he had a lot of different ideas that he threw out there. Uh, some of them were very abstract to us and he, he was trying to tell us what he wanted to do with it. Uh, so he said, just give me all the books and history and stuff you can give on the fire department and I'll do my research on it and I'll come back with something that you guys will like. So he came back with his thought and he was trying to explain it to us. But when he laid out a model of it, it was incredible. So out front there are Indiana limestone pillars that have the names of all the firefighters killed in the line of duty engraved with their date of death. Uh, they start off small and they work to a higher sphere. Uh, the tops are broken off and jagged to symbolize the, the violent death that they had and then the sides are very smooth to show the pure life that right. they lived. And then it comes to the center when the spokes all come together to a larger column that at the top of it has a phoenix rising from the ashes, symbolizing taking all the firefighter souls to heaven. So every fire prevention week, first week of October, we will open up the doors here at the museum, we'll block off Massachusetts Avenue, and we do our reading of the names. We toll the bell for every firefighter, we bring in all of the uh, survivors that want to come, and we remember their loved ones every year. And unfortunately, we still add names to it. So this year we added two names that we've lost in the last couple of years to it. What a beautiful monument to celebrate yeah. those souls. Yeah. This museum has so much history in it, and as I look through all the pictures and all the items, I'm in awe of everything I've seen today. Can you tell us about your two favorite pieces here in the museum? Uh, well, we're sitting right between them. Yeah. Um, if you know Indiana history, you know that Indiana was uh, one of the big pushes to be the automotive capital, automotive manufacturing capital of, of the United States. Uh, between Detroit and Cleveland, we know Detroit won out in time, but Indiana at one point in time had 47 different startup or clear manufacturers of uh, automobiles here. And one of the local ones here was Stutz. You might have heard of a Stutz Bearcat or some of the cars, you know, from the right. early 1900s up to about uh, uh, the Great Depression or so and into that they were being built. And these are two of our finest pieces from the Indianapolis Fire Department fleet. We have a ladder company to our right. Uh, we found this out of Sayville, New York. They called one day and said, hey, we've got this old ladder truck that uh, we'd like to give back to your museum. Uh, the uh, owner uh, that had had it said he would love to have it come back here. We had it shipped back here. Uh, the guy pulled up out front and he sat there and looked at us. And he goes, I don't know how this thing works. And I climbed onto it and said, I don't either. I don't know how we're going to get it off <laughs> right. your trailer. So I called one of our old battalion chiefs, uh, Clyde Feaster, and I knew he owned a shop built Stutz. 
And he came down and looked at it and just smiled. He and his wife came down and he jumped right up on it, fired it up, backed it off of the trailer. And he said, let's go for a ride. So we jumped on the side of it. We drove all over downtown Indianapolis. I mean, he looked like a little kid just beaming with pride. He couldn't <laughs> believe we had found a ladder truck that was here originally. And this was owned by Bill Brown, one of our firefighters who recently donated it to us. He did a complete frame up restoration on it. It's old engine 15. So these were both, at one point in time, the entire Indianapolis Fire Department fleet were shop built, or were, I'm sorry, were Stutz fire apparatus. Uh, we have in the rear a shop built that Clyde owned and he donated to us as well. Um, before the war, during the war, they couldn't get World War II, they couldn't get any of the parts to build things. So we bought the frames, the chassis, and the motors, and they sent them down to our repair shops, and they fabricated everything for it then. So we kept the Stutz fleet up, but everything wasn't manufactured at Stutz. We did it right in-house. Right in-house, yeah. right in-house. So if when folks come to visit the Indianapolis Firefighters Museum, what are you hoping they take home from it? We hope that as you stop out front and you see the memorial, you realize what firefighters do for the community, what sacrifices they're willing to give. Right. Uh, and you understand the devotion to duty that firefighters have. Then when you come inside the museum and you walk around and you see back to the days, like I say, of, you know, originally there were horse-drawn apparatus that were out of here. Right. We would be sitting in a common area. If we could go back to the 1880s, this would be a dirt floor. Uh, it would smell like horses. You're living Same. in a barn. Right. There'd, be, There'd a... be a couple dogs around. <laughs> right. uh, if, the, if they would tap out a fire, the horses would walk out of their stalls behind us right underneath the harnesses that would be suspended from the ceilings and drop down, strap onto them. The guys would get on and they would go. Uh, they would go out to a fire. They would know where the cisterns were, where the fire was located. They would dig down in. They'd find the cistern, drill a hole in it, stick the hose down in there and draft the water out of it. Then they would put it with a, a plug in it. That's where everyone where the word fire plug came fire from. Plug. They would put a cedar plug into it. And then the pointer dogs that they had, like Dalmatians and some of the short haired pointers, you would, your traditional firehouse right. dogs could sniff those plugs out in the future. They'd okay. run ahead of the fire truck and then point and they'd be able to dig it out. Uh, just to know where we've come from. So when you see these modern million dollar apparatuses flying down the street, you know, with all the chrome and everything that's on right. it, you go back to the day where it was just, it was horse drawn. They yes. were, they were tough, hardened men. Most of them were immigrants, you know, Irish, Italian, German immigrants that came over. They lived at the station. You never went home. Well, you went home, but you were either a one mealer or a two mealer. If you were a horse ride away from the station, you'd ride your horse home and you'd go home for one meal a day. Uh, if you could walk, you'd go home for two meals a day, but you'd have to listen to the tower because if the tower bell started, you'd have to come have back to, come to the back. firehouse. There was a fire. Uh, it didn't pay much, but if you were a single man, it was perfect. If you didn't mind the smell of horses and you didn't mind hard work, <laughs> dangerous work, you had a place to stay and some money in your pocket. This so just to see the transition and realize that modern fire finance you have, where it's come from. So it sounds like once the Indianapolis firefighters retire, they tend to turn around and invest back into the museum. We, we, uh, uh, we're a cradle to grave organization, I was once told. Once you take the oath and you come on the job, you're a firefighter for life, you never change. And I've got 38 years on the fire department, I'll be retiring in a couple of years, I'll do 41 years of service, but I've been around the fire department my entire life. And just like every other, there's nothing, I'm not saying I'm special, there's absolutely nothing special about me. I'm like every other firefighter that's out there. Uh, we have retirees breakfast and retirees lunches here. Uh, retirees work as docents for the museum. If there's any cleanup or anything that needs to be done, we are very proud of what we do and we love what we do and it never leaves us. We're always firefighters. Yes. Tell, tell me a little bit about the Veterans Memorial Walk. That was something that came secondary to um, the Fallen Firefighters Memorial. On the front of the building, you'll notice there's three plaques of uh, our people that have been killed in line of, uh, killed during active duty in war. Uh, there's a gentleman from World War I that was killed in France, Charles Haas who was killed on Okinawa, and Gary Henry who most recently was killed in Iraq. There was a plaque that had all the names of the World War II firefighters in headquarters, and the chief at the time said, that really needs to be at the museum. Once you take yeah. it out here and nobody sees it, put it on the front of the museum, so we did. And then after that, all the other guys that had fought in all the other conflicts, you know, you had uh, uh, Korea, you had Vietnam, you, you just go through all of them to uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm. You go into uh, Panama, you go into uh, Grenada, you go into the modern wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
We have a lot of veterans that we hire. A lot of firefighters currently still serve as reserve units. Uh, and there was nothing for them, the, the, the three that were out front in the World War II guys. So we, native Indiana limestone, we built huge blocks and set them out front. And if you have served in a foreign conflict, your name gets engraved in that. So you walk around the very front of our building and your name is there showing not only did you serve to protect the country, you came home and you protect your city. Howard, you mentioned that the museum hosts several educational programs. Can you tell us more about the Survive Alive program? Sure. I our motto is preserving the past and protecting the future. We've obviously preserved the past as you've been through and can see, but protecting the future is the future in our children. Nothing more tragic than the death of a child at a fire, and nothing messes with a firefighter's psyche any more than that than to, than to fail at their task and lose a child. So we developed a program uh, through Maryville, Indiana. We took their basic program that they had and developed it into the livery stable, which we bought next door, and we had the children survive alive up there. We target second graders in all of Marion County. We try to get them to come in. Uh, all the schools will bring people in, churches will bring people in. Uh, they can come in and go through our entire program. It starts out by an introduction of a firefighter, and we show you the type of equipment that we wear. They'll put on all their gear, they'll put on their face piece, their SCBA and all, and crawl towards the, fire, the kids. So they, if there is a fire, they won't get scared and run from us. They'll know what we look like and what we right. sound like. Uh, Dating myself, everybody looks like Darth Vader, you know, and their equipment and all, and it scares <laughs> right. children, it, it really does. It uh, so we will go through all of that, teach them not to play with matches, teach them different things to do, and then we'll give them some life safety drills too, uh, about electric stuff around bathtubs, space heaters, uh, don't put stuff in front of water heaters. We'll walk them through a home, we have a whole village up there that they go through, and then they will also pretend to be in their home when the smoke detector goes off, and how do you react? How do you get out of the house? We know two ways to escape, different things that we can do. They will come out and then they go to a neighbor's house, they go over to the neighbor's house, they report the fire, and then they get on the phone and they dial 911, which actually goes to our control center upstairs, and they will answer it, 911, what's your emergency? And they make them say, what's your address, what's your name, what's your problem, and tell them that we're on the way. So they tell us, teachers and people tell us that the second grade age is the perfect age to imprint this thing in children's minds. Yeah. And over the years, we are 20 some years into this project now, oh. actually closer to 30 now right. into this project. Um, We've had several success stories where parents and people have called back and said, my child learned to call, and not just fires, medical emergencies, other things that are going on. They know they need help. They pick up the phone and dial 911, and I'm so-and-so, and this is my address, and this is what's wrong. Please help us. Wow. Survive a live program. What a great program. Yeah. So glad it's working. Yeah. It's nice to hear success stories, isn't it? Oh, it is. It really is. It really is. Sounds great. I've, I've really enjoyed myself in your museum this, this week. So great. can you tell me a little bit more about if I were going to come visit, what my hours would be, when the best time to come? Yeah, I, I'm basically 8 to 4, Monday through Friday, um, uh, not holidays or anything. Our, our local uh, offices for Local 416 are open. You can come in and tour the museum that day. You might meet Brian, who's our curator. Uh, and then April through October on Saturdays, 10 to 4-ish. Uh, these doors will be open when the weather's nice. These chairs, people will be sitting out front. You'll have two retired firefighters who serve as docents and um, prepare to hear a lot of stories and spend a few minutes coming through here because they will pin you down and they will talk your ear off. They, they're, they're ready for yes. you. Yeah. <laughs> they're ready for <laughs> visitors. <laughs> <laughs> they love to tell their stories. I'll be one of them one day. One day you will yeah. be. You're, about to, you're almost about to outserve Jacob Petty. Uh, indeed. <laughs> I'll never be the man never Jacob be. Petty was, but I'll put some time in. Thank you so much for having us at the Indianapolis Firefighters Museum today. I've really enjoyed the tour. I've enjoyed everything I've seen, all the history that's been presented to us. You've done a wonderful job, you and all the firefighters of restoring fire, Firehouse thank Number Two. So thanks for talking to us today. I hope you at home get a chance to visit the Indianapolis Firefighters Museum. I'm Jacqueline Cox, and this is History in Your Own Backyard. Mm -hmm.